Uh, I'll introduce Charles Adediloya. Uh He will be speaking on machine learning platform tooling with Apache Beam on Kubernetes. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming to uh, my talk. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with Apache Beam on Kubernetes. Uh, we gave a talk last year, so this is just an extension of the talk from last year. So uh, I'm an MLOps engineer at Maven Code. Uh, basically, we help uh, data scientists productionalize their machine learning model. And uh, we get to work with uh, different clients on different platforms. Some are on Google Cloud uh, natively, where we can use Dataflow. But we have other clients running on other environments on-prem, uh, Azure, AWS, and things like that. So our goal is to be able to production, I mean, run Beam on all these platforms, uh, leverage it on the uh, Beam portability behavior and um, the portability on the infrastructure side with Kubernetes so that you can basically run all your Beam workloads um, on Kubernetes. So we do a lot of things on ML. So this talk is gonna be ML-centric. Uh, we basically go through the steps of uh, uh, training a model, deploying the model, and um, all the stages of your typical ML flow and things like that. So um, let's get started. So uh, just a quick rundown and overview of Apache Beam and Kubernetes. Uh, the main objective of, of any ML project is to train a model, and from that model, uh, you want to quickly make inference and things like that. So whatever you're doing on the cloud on-prem or on Jupyter Notebook, that's always a goal. So a typical uh, ML lifecycle kind of looks like this. Uh, you ingest the data, you do data prep, uh, feature engineering to make sure you have the right set of features, you do the model training, and evaluate the model and get your Apple model after that. But it's a little bit more complex, so you go through all these stages iteratively. You go back each step. You want to retrain, rebuild, and stuff like that. And um, over the life cycle of any ML project, especially big ML projects, you have data engineering guys responsible for preparing your data for you. Uh, you have data scientists that need the data from the feature store uh, to train the model. And once you train the model, you deploy the model in someone uh, on the API side, picks up the model, and tries to use it. So all these interactions happen over any ML project lifecycle, and um, you get to interact with your team members as you do this. But the cool thing about Beam, uh, with the way Beam is going and the vision of Apache Beam is like it makes it easy because you have all components around Beam that allows you to do this. Uh, you have the IOs that allow you to connect your data source. If you're like on BigQuery, Kafka, whatever the uh, IO, whatever the source of the data, you have the IOs for that. Uh, you have the transformation functions that allows you to build your pipelines to do things like uh, data preparation, feature engineering, and uh, you have the run inference libraries that inter integrate with TensorFlow, uh, Scikit-Learn, PyTorch, and all those things. So uh, everything we can see in Beam. Uh, we can see Apache Beam touches everything in ML pipeline development. Uh, from unified streaming, your batch, your streaming uh, data pipeline, you can combine it. You have all these rich transform side inputs. Uh, fault tolerance, which is something about ML program. I mean, if you're building an ML pipeline, if any of your component fails, you want to be able to retry it. So you want to build a resilient pipeline that can do that. And um, scalability, but more importantly, this talk is going to be more about the portability aspects, which what really attracted us to Beam. The fact that you have the multi-language portability on the uh, imp implementation side where someone can write uh, their code in Golang or Java or Python, and it combines to the same specification that runs on all the runners. And on the execution side, you can use Dataflow, which is kind of like the de facto standard, or you can use uh, Spark, uh, Flink, or any other runners out there. So um, if you want to think about, about it from the runner perspective, uh, basically you have all these runners that are out there. Uh, natively, uh, Beam can run on all these runners, but one of the challenges that Beam is, has tried to solve is the portability implementation of Beam that allows you to quickly, quickly target any, any of the runners out there. So but by default, you have all these runners that are kind of like legacy right now, the legacy classic approach, because it makes it difficult for you to like write your code and you, um, and you have to port it to all these other uh, runner implementations. So you have the portability framework that allows you to do that now, where you can basically connect to the SDKs, uh, Python SDK, Go SDK, uh, TypeScript, um, Rust, and I think I saw someone talked about Rust earlier. And those SDKs can now allow you to port to any of the running, uh, runnable infrastructures uh, behind, the, behind the scene. So uh, just to reiterate, this is what the Beam portability uh, model looks like. You have all this gallery of SDKs. As a developers or team work on, it, on the Beam side from the team com uh, Beam community. And these SDKs basically take your code, they convert it to the proto format, 
and uh, basically the runner API can now be target to, targeted to the, or any of the runners that basically implements uh, all the functionalities from the Proto interface. And you have the Fun API that basically, Fun API that allows you to like target any of the execution engine. Uh, basically Java, Python, or Golang, whatever the execution backend is. So uh, if we want to take a look at it from the developer perspective, it, it kind of it looks like this as a developer or ML engineer or data scientist, you have the SDK environment where you work. Uh, you basically uh, bootstrap your code. You select the SDK you're using, Python, uh, Java, or whatever the SDK is. And you basically have the job service that basically runs and translates all your code to run on all the possible executor engine then. You have the artifacts uh, storage. Basically, you have uh, a part where you can basically take all, it carries all your artifacts from your SDK environment, all your dependencies, and sends it to the job service. Then it packages it uh, through the runner. It schedules it to run on any of the uh, runners that you have. So that's the BIM architecture, the philosophy behind it, uh, BIM portability. So if you want to look at it from the entry point, uh, you probably have seen this a lot if you're familiar with BIM, but if you're new to it, uh, you specify the options, uh, the pipeline options, with the job uh, end endpoints where you're going to submit your job, uh, the artifact endpoints for all the artifacts, all the libraries and dependencies. Then they have different environments. In this case, this is Docker. If it's external, in case of Kubernetes, you can have it that way. So uh, these are the endpoints, and you can basically uh, check the documentation for all the different com com uh, com combinations of inputs that you need for your job. And you select the SDK type. In this case, I'm running a Python uh, BIM job. So uh, for us, the benefits of portability as a team is the language flexibility. We have people who are natively writing things in Python. We have things that we developed in Java, Golang. So we have the language flexibility. As long as you select the SDK, uh, you can basically run on any of our uh, executor, I mean, on, on any of our runners. Most of the time, we use pack runners, so uh, we kind of have we have that language agnostic behavior. We can create a reuse, reusable pipeline. Um, we leverage the cross language uh, transform. So I love all the I/O transforms that are written in Java, so we can basically reuse it in Python and things like that. So um, overall, it helps us to reduce the time of development as well. So basically, it speeds up our uh, development time, reduce the cost because. While people are still getting started, they can basically test things on their local without basically running on the cloud where you basically have to spend some money uh, if you're running on any of the managed cloud services. So uh, the other part of this, we'll, now, we'll talk about how we basically connect the upper side, which is uh, the portability on the BIM side to portability on Kubernetes. So Kubernetes basically tries to solve the same problem that BIM is solving on the portability side, and that Kubernetes allows you to create that abstraction layer that makes your code portable between any of the major cloud providers, uh, Google, Azure, or any environment, or on-prem, because it abstracts the underlying infrastructure. So as long as you deploy your application on Kubernetes, everything runs uh, easily, and you can easily shift and live between all these environments. So uh, let's imagine the pipeline we saw earlier, all the steps you go through in any ML process. Uh, basically, the data ingestion, preparation, feature engineering, model training. If you put it on Kubernetes, then you basically abstract the underlying layer. So that means once I have Kubernetes running on my laptop, the same code can run on any on-prem server. The same code can run on AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. Uh, if you're on Google Cloud, you can use Dataflow, but you can basically bootstrap an EKS cluster that allows you to run uh, your pipeline on the Kubernetes uh, infrastructure uh, that comes with Google Cloud as well. So uh, the full stack will kind of look like this, where you have uh, the underlying infrastructure, uh, which could be your laptop, and you have a manifest that deploys your Kubernetes, and you have your operators uh, that runs your Spark, uh, Flink, Xamster, or whatever operator you choose. Then you have the pipe, portable pipeline runner API that basically takes your SDK codes and transforms it. And you can target any of this infrastructure. Um, and everything is abstracted away from you. So you can run the same code on your local. You take the same code, you deploy it on the, infra, on the on prem infra. Or you take the same code and deploy it on Google Cloud, and everything just works seamlessly. So um, this is a typical ML development workflow that we have in our organization uh, whenever you get started. Or you can basically bootstrap a Minikube environment, which is a small footprint Minikube that runs on your local computer. 
and you can have your Spark operator, and you can basically have your job service. And the same BIM code, you can get started testing things on your local, running it on your, uh, on your Minikube. And you can take the same code and deploy it on the, shared, on the uh, production server. Everything should work because you have the same baseline, the descriptors and everything that you use on your local environments uh, for your uh, Kubernetes YAML is the same thing that you have on the production. And um, the job service is the same Docker container. So we basically share the Docker container. It runs on your Minikube, and we can deploy it on Kubernetes as well. So one thing we now do is to basically use GitOps process to basically bootstrap the infrastructure in the production environment. So basically, we use Argo CD to like uh, deploy the customized manifest on the Kubernetes infrastructure in prod. And the same uh, manifest can be applied on your local. So uh, the BIM project is always in the flux and the Spark project as well. A lot of changes are happening, so we can basically get the kind of change we want, uh, the kind of the version of the BIM you want to deploy. Whenever there's an update, once we validate that it's stable, then we can get up it into the Kubernetes environment on the production server after testing it on that local dev. So uh, we have a shared setup as well, where uh, before you go into production, we have a shared cluster where we basically bootstrap and run all the things that we're doing. And in some cases, we have this for some of our customers. They have different environments. So you have the underlying Kubernetes infrastructure that basically sits on any of the cloud providers. Uh, we can provision Kubernetes to run on their clusters and install whatever exec uh, runner they want, Spark operators, uh, Flink operator, or whatever it is. Then everybody runs in a namespace. So we kind of create like a nice resource isolation. So while you're working and testing your so stuff, you can run it on the server in a shared dedicated namespace uh, assigned to you. Uh, with allocated resource, you can run your job. And eventually, if you want to like basically, um, if you want to like um, share your work with the team members, you can basically like, we have a team namespace where everyone can access everything in that namespace and they can deploy the job. If I'm working on a part of the pipeline, let's say I'm working on the data pri uh, preparation stage, I can share my container with someone working on the feature engineering stage, and we combine everything together to run it in this shared namespace. So the benefits to the team, basically, um, we, we're able to like quickly iterate and uh, implement solutions for our customers, uh, improved uh, productivity because we can break down the task. Uh, if someone is working on all the ingestion, uh, they can basically work on all the I.O. in a Docker container. If you're working on feature engineering pipelines, we can basically containerize your workload. At the end of the day, we can glue everything together and orchestrate it through a workflow pipeline that is native to Kubernetes. Uh, we use Argo Workflow a lot for that. Or you can use Airflow and things like that. Uh, it's a lot of cost savings, especially a lot of new people getting into BIM and trying to like uh, get a kick of it before uh, they fully start becoming productive on the team. So we can set them up with Minikube, and they can run things on their local without just uh, burning a lot of credits on the cloud infrastructure and things like that. And the other thing is the infrastructure elasticity that Kubernetes affords you. You can scale the node pool uh, if you're using Google or EKS or Azure, you can scale the underlying uh, node pool. So during the peak period when a lot of people are at work, you can scale the resource and they can deploy their workload containers. And once they're done, you can just shrink it back. It does that automatically, by the way. Then um, improved uptime and reliability. Uh, basically, the DevOps guys can basically manage the resource and see how things are going. Then uh, we have some customers that are really concerned about uh, security of their data sets, so we can basically keep everything in the same space with them. Uh, things like um, EPA compliance, PCI compliance, and things like that. It makes it a lot more easier for us to do uh, since we're running everything in a controlled environment. So I'm going to walk through some demos that talks about um, how we deploy this, and I'll show you the Minikube examples um, uh, that we've uh, pre-recorded. So. Basically, these are like kind of like the, the four steps we go through in summary. Uh, you basically set up your local environment, make sure you have all the good stuff in place, uh, your Docker scaffold uh, for building containers, you have Minikube, uh, you check out the code. We have a template that contains everything we need to do. Uh, you make sure you have the Go, uh, Go Pad JDK environment set up correctly. Um, we package the containers for you. Uh, basically, we have containers that are built up or all the public containers that we're pulling. Uh, the deployment YAML is all in the repo, so you can modify it to add a new container or new components. And after that, you, you're good to start running your BIM code, so you can test your BIM code on your local before you basically put it in the production environment or integrate with the other team members. So this is um, a typical developer workflow. 
Uh, I'm gonna play this and try to make it a little bit more faster. So basically what we're doing in this case is like we're bootstrapping a Minikube. So we have a make file that basically uh, makes it super fast to like uh, bootstrap the Minikube. So you basically have the, uh, the make file. The make file will basically create a Minikube for you. You specify the number of cars or the memory size, just like get you going and things like that. So this starts a new Minikube for you. And once you have your Minikube up, um, uh, you can now provision the Spark operators. Uh, we're not using operators in this demo, but we use Spark operators that basically runs. And if you're using Flink as well, you can deploy your Flink on top of it. So this basically provisions everything you need to get started on your local. So you have a mini cube environment that's gonna mirror what you have in a uh, production-based Kubernetes. So uh, the next thing is to basically uh, provision the next stage of uh, all the manifests that we need. In this case, we're using a Spark operator. So you have a Spark that sits on top of the, Kubernetes, uh, the local Kubernetes you have on Minikube. So you have the driver, the worker nodes. In this case, you have three worker. You can scale the workers as needed or based on the capacity that you have on your laptop. Uh, you have the persistent volume and the artifact and the runner, the artifact stage and the runner. So whenever you basically select your BIM as the key. You can submit your job to the job service. Uh, the runner will take, I will convert the proto spec to uh, whatever executor you have to run. Uh, in this case, it's Spark. Uh, you have the artifact uh, uh, stager where you basically upload all the dependencies and all the libraries you need. So what we've done is to have a persistent volume because we don't want to have network overhead. So this volume is exposed to the underlying worker. So the worker can basically be, I mean, the volume is mounted. So all the artifacts you uploaded will be in a shared volume with the workers and the worker can easily uh, read up um, through the anis. They can basically connect to the persistent volume and read whatever you have in there. So this is a deployment YAML for the job server. Uh, basic, uh, is it big enough? Yeah, basic, uh, it's a basic status YAML that basically allows you to deploy an instance of the job service. So this is uh, the description. You have the parts, the container part for the job service and the expansion part for basically, um, the, the expansion part if you're doing things like cross language transform where you need to talk uh, to the, uh, to do AI or transform leverage and other uh, features, but we're not using it in this case then. We basically start up the job service, you specify uh, the Spark, the external Spark cluster location. So basically you connect to the Spark cluster from here. Then this is a Spark master. Uh, basically, we're setting up a containerized Spark that basically contains um, a Spark with a worker node. In this case, we have one master, and that master is going to talk to all the workers and all the executors. So this is a spec for the YAML spec on Kubernetes for the um, for the uh, for the Spark executor, the uh, the workers and the Anis that basically gets uh, it's a cycle, so the Anis basically stays right next to the worker, and that way you can basically the the worker can talk to the Anis as see if it's a local host setup. So we have the the main YAML. I mean, sorry, we have the image and the containers for the Spark worker itself. Then you have the Anis. Uh, you need to select the right anis that matches your uh, your SDK, the SDK you're running against. And this is the artifact story that is shared with the job service. So this stack basically allows you to bootstrap your environment with the job service that allows you to do, um, but that allows, that supports the beam portability. And the next thing is, like, uh, this is a, just a uh, this description of the PVC, the volume that you share. So you just provision a volume. And that volume is like, um, you can set it to like one gig. So that means all the libraries and all the dependencies I bring in will be dumped in this whenever you uh, up, you run it against the, port, uh, the portability spec on the portable runner. So I'm just gonna show you uh, how this works uh, real quick. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. So we basically build up the namespace, we just make sure everything is in the right namespace. So we create a Spark namespace. Uh, you can call it anything you want. So basically, you create a container. Then it creates the PVC, which is where all the artifacts and all the libraries and dependencies will be dropped. Then the next thing is like, uh, I'll create my job service. So basically, it bootstrap the job service container, uh, which is where my SDK is going to make a call and basically uh, send make all the API calls and 
the artifact staging is going to happen on that. So that's the next thing I do. Then the next thing is to basically um, start up this pack. So, uh, so we have, uh, let me speed it up a little bit. So uh, the next needs to start the Spark cluster. So once I run that make uh, file operation, it's gonna create uh, my Spark master and the walker. I just try to scale things down a little bit because I don't wanna run out of space. So I'm just using one walker, but if you have a higher capacity on your laptop, you can basically create uh, more than one walker container. So it basically bootstraps the Spark master, which is a primary and all the, and the walkers. So you can always scale the walkers depending on what you're doing and how things are going. I'm just gonna try to speed this up so that we can. So everything should be bootstrapped at the end of the process. Uh, so this is a log, so I'll just check the logs to make sure the job server is running, uh, the Spark master is running, and everything is running as expected. So now I have my environment, I have the, the bootstrap as the key. I have the Anis, I have the job service, and I have my Spark cluster. You can flip the Spark and use Flink. Um, we've tried that use case as well. So this is how it looks. Um, this is the shared uh, persistent storage, and these are the Spark drivers, the walkers, uh, the artifact stager, um, everything all connected together after that. So the next thing is to try to basically submit my jobs. So this is my training component, and um, I'll just specify in this case, I've already created my feature sets and basically training a model uh, based on those feature sets and I'm outputting the model to this location. This is my job service endpoint. Uh, this is uh, the artifact uh, storage endpoint, which it's the same thing but different part numbers. And it's external, basically. Uh, that's uh, basically I have my Kubernetes cluster and I basically connect to it in an external mode, not a Docker service node. Then this is um, where the, um, <coughs> the runners basically talk, uh, the anus basically talks back to the worker on this part, so you specify the environment. So I'm just gonna run everything uh, one last time. So this is my complete job in terms of I wanna have everything running, a complete pipeline. So the first thing I do is like build all the containers. So I skip some te steps here just to save time. So you basically build all the containers for all your workloads that you're trying to run. So we use Caffle to build that. Uh, let me increase playback speed. So I'll go in. Um, these are like all the components that we saw in this diagram, like the ingestion, the preparation, and feature engineering. So you have container for each stage. So I'll go in and build a Docker container for that stage. Um, then I have this entry point shell script that basically bootstraps the Python code, and it basically specifies the output location. I'm using a portable runner and the environments I want to run in. So I'll just make scaffold build and build all these containers for all the different uh, jobs uh, once I want to run everything together. So the next step is where I now uh, basically deploy everything. So in this case, I've done everything, I've built my containers and everything is good to go. So the next thing I'm trying to do now is to basically submit my job to run against the containers uh, that I have deployed on Kubernetes on my local. So let me speed this up and just talk through it. So these are like all the different Python scripts for different stages of my jobs I'm trying to run. Uh, these are, those are the entry points. So I'll, I basically created a fresh mini cube uh, but we can skip that step. That um, basically, I recreate my Spark cluster because I can easily do that um, through the containers. I'll make sure that all the pods are up and all the job service and everything around that is up. That I'm gonna speed it up a little bit because we're running out of time. Then the next thing I'll do is to basically check to make sure the master, so Spark master is ready and everything around that is okay, then I'll check my job service as well to make sure everything is okay. So the job server is ready as well, so I can basically, I'm ready to like write my code and submit it to the endpoint. So in this case, I'm taking a look at the data prep container. Um, Basically, I create a data prep container with a shell script entry point, and it's submitting the job to the job service. Then um, I can look at the logs on the Spark cluster as well. So this is the Spark um, 
I'm trying to see if the job is deployed correctly because I can look at the, uh, the Spark master. So I'm going to open the browser. So the job service got deployed. Uh, it's deployed on the Spark master. So this is a Spark master, and this is my job that basically gets, I mean, got submitted to the Spark cluster through the job service. So that's how we basically run on all these environments. So once everything is working and I can run my pipeline successfully, I can easily shift and lift this whole operation and go run it on the production environments. And every developer responsible for each stage of the component can test their workload and make sure everything is okay before we combine it together into a pipeline and move it to the production cluster. So uh, lessons learned, uh, the promise of portability across multi multiple environments is a great advantage, but the capability is still vary. Some things you can do on Spark, some things you can do on uh, Dataflow, and you can do on Flink and things like that. So uh, the resource management, consumption, scheduling this resource to make sure uh, it's easy to like uh, run our jobs without any issue. Uh, we're still working on that. Then the other thing is um, the learning curve of understanding Kubernetes uh, once you're getting started. Uh, there's a little bit of learning curve, but once you get over those humps, I think everything is good to go. Then um, the other thing we're trying to do is to improve the login. Uh, to make sure it's easier for us to so just monitor all these containers from a centralized log location in production and be able to know when, when things are failing or where we need to upload, update some things and stuff like that. So uh, that's where we are. Uh, we're looking to open source this and we're looking for support from the community. If you're doing anything with Spark runners or Flink runners, we'll want to talk and know what you guys are doing and how we can improve this. So we're going to open source this in the, in the next few days and we look forward to your feedbacks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.